Travel back in time to the 80s, reliving the shenanigans. It was the early 80s, and sex was still a good way to meet new people. The disappointment. And that's a real shame when folks be throwing away a perfectly good white boy like that. And the self-confidence. I'm six foot, three inches tall, and maintain a very consistent panda bear shape. Because just like you, we're stuck in the 80s. Sure, it's not 1985 right now, but who knows what tomorrow will bring. Welcome to Stuck in the 80s. It's your pals. It's your host, Spearsy. And Brad in LA. And today we tackle two more underappreciated movies that just turned 30 years old. Something really weird is happening. Yesterday was my 13th birthday. And then, and then today I woke up and I'm this. And you, I mean, you're that. You get it? Don't forget, Stuck in the 80s is a member of the CLNS Podcast Network. You can find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and the CLNS Media mobile app. So we're back again, and we're talking about underappreciated movies. And I think the concept here, as we've explained before, are these are movies that maybe me and Brad connect with e- either back in the fall of 1987 or maybe more recently we saw it again on HBO or, or Hulu, and we feel like they didn't quite get their due back then. That's very much true for mine. Uh, and I, I know it's very much true for yours because I don't even think I've heard of your movie. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but we have we'll have a fun time. We'll tell you a little about it. We'll tell you if you can find it online, uh, where you can watch it. Then we'll scoot ahead, catch up on some seggies, and we'll call it a day. What do you say? I think it's going to be great. Let's let's hit this baby. Let's hit it hard. Hit it now. Hey, before we get started, just a quick reminder. Here at Stuck in the Eighties, we're kind of relying on advertising as a way to support the show, and we try to find sponsors that we think the Eighties Nation can connect to. So, in if you could just do us a really quick favor and go to the following URL: podcastlistener.com/slash/radical and answer a few short questions. I swear it'll only take two minutes of your time, but it would be really helpful to us. Again, the URL is podcastlistener dot com slash radical that'll help us keep stuck in the 80s free and alive for a long time to come woot woot long may it wave steve spears long <laughs> may it wave i don't know what's it been 12 years now 12 uh, you know people keep I, I wouldn't say people but it does come up from time to time how long do you think you're gonna do it i'm like i don't know i couldn't well, even the, tell the, you the, i couldn't even yeah, tell I mean, you the, <laughs> when we get tired of it and we run out of stuff to talk about i guess i'll quit could it be this episode it just might. This might be the beginning of the end. You could be hearing history right here. I don't know. If this is the movie I have to go out defending, I'm okay with that. From November of 1987, I give you the uh, fantasy comedy classic Made in Heaven. Anything that you can imagine is. Nothing is lost. It's an odyssey that's timeless. This is a wonderful adventure. It's a romance that's eternal. Did I say you could do that? No. Do it again. It's an experience out of this world. If I imagine something bad. You can't. You're in heaven. Timothy Hutton and Kelly McGillis are a match made in heaven. Rated PG. Starts Friday, November 6th. Check newspapers for theaters and showtimes. So Made in Heaven was released on November 6th, 1987. And as I as I gently and non-ironically refer to it as, it was billed as a fantasy comedy movie. Fantasy comedy? I don't even know what that means. I don't Is know like either. Lord of the Rings with jokes? You know, Willow. Willow would be a fantasy comedy. Eh, I get that. Yes. Okay. I get that. Yeah. Willow has its funny moments. You know, Legend with a couple song and dance numbers in it, maybe? Yes. Yes, Legend is practically Caddyshack, uh, but it's underground. Caddyshack. Yeah, it's Caddyshack underground. Exactly. That's the elevator pitch. But um, Made in Heaven, have you seen this, Brad? I have not. I've seen clips of it because I know we've talked about it before. And I remember, isn't one of at one point, isn't one of the characters like a movie producer? Or I'm sorry, a music producer? 
and they have some, he's a musician okay yeah. so he's a musician yeah. so there's a, a scene where they're in a st- recording studio and i remember right. that exactly so so let me give you the rundown real quick you'll quickly see Please i think do. why th- why this is not a comedy the movie is about two souls timothy hutton and kelly mcgillis who meet in heaven and fall in love okay oh timothy hutton's character's name mike and his character dies early in the movie, saving a woman and her kids from drowning. Oh, my gosh. How noble is that? <laughs> I know. So already we're rolling in the aisles. <laughs> Kelly McGillis. <laughs> Kelly McGillis's character is named Annie, and she's what we call a newborn soul, which is that she is born in heaven and has not yet lived on Earth. What? And he, That's not in I my know. Bible, <laughs> Mr. Spears. Herein lies the problem. Though they fall in love in heaven, she's still required to go back to Earth and do a tour of duty as a human. Hmm. So they're going to be broken up. So they finally find love in heaven, only to have it torn away so Annie can go back and be a human. Well, this is, uh, uh, this is really hilarious. <laughs> Grief-stricken, our boy Hutton cuts a deal with a chain-smoking, orange-hair-spiked angel named Emmett, who I only recently learned is actually played by Deborah Winger. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Who uh, was married to Timothy Hutton at the time. So I guess the cancer uh, was worse than they thought in uh, terms of endearment. <laughs> God, that's, that's wrong. Uh, so Emmett agrees to send Mike back to Earth, but with the stipulation that neither he or Annie remember each other, and he has until just his 30th birthday to find her. Uh, what, wait, wait, wait. And, and then what? What does God like erase them or something? What happens if he doesn't find her? Like, he doesn't they're find not going to both 30, end up he, in, in heaven eventually? Well, the idea being is if, he, is if they find each other, they will recognize each other's souls and it will become an automatic. Yeah, but what, aha, if, but we what were, if they didn't? Who cares? They'll, they'll both end up in then, heaven eventually, right? But, but theoretically, that's it. That's his only chance. He's got 30 years to find it. The don't try, the don't try to poke holes. This is so screwed up. This is like... Don't try to poke holes. This is like serendipity 30 years early, and that movie was terrible. Right. Right. Yeah, I, I really can't stand serendipity. It's bad. So, this anyway, is a okay, movie I'm, I'm about, on board now. I love this movie. This is great. Yeah, don't, don't don't poke holes in the plot. Okay. Like, with, with so many movies in the 80s, don't poke holes in the plot. I'm sorry. It's my nature. It's one <laughs> of my least endearing characteristics. It's one of the most annoying characteristics of you. Like I said. <laughs> anyway... It's more of a heartbreaking kind of a movie. So here's some factoids about it, I'm trying to sell you on the concept. Okay. It's the first big screen movie that Kelly McGillis did after Top Gun. Okay, well, you have my interest. In 1988, the year after this movie came out, she would star in The Accused. But I think it's safe to say that this is kind of like the sweet spot in her acting career. Yeah, I don't remember The Accused at all. What? You don't. lost your mind. Well, obviously. You remember the movie you're going to oh, wait, but wait, you don't wait, remember wait. The Accused. Oh, yes. Of course I remember this. Yes. Horrible. I mean, yeah. it's a horrible story. Good movie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Horrible. Yeah, this is not one of those, hey, let's pop some popcorn and watch this on a Friday night after a busy week. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy Hutton, on the other hand, hard to say when his career peaked. He did Ordinary People, another barn burner in oh, the comedy gosh. department oh. in 1980. He followed it up with the, what do you call it? The cheerful taps. military school romp. Or yes. Taps. Yes. Right. It's practically a musical, the taps. <laughs> And then um, The Falcon and the Snowman, which I think is another vastly oh, underrated movie. That is such a good movie. Came out in 85. He had Turk 182. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of a that's kind of a that's, cult movie at best. That's a placeholder. Yeah. There's some other pretty uh, interesting cameos in this movie besides the freakish Deborah Winger role, <laughs> which I, I'm still not really uh, Jarring. over. <laughs> Rick Ocasek appears in this movie. Oh, yeah. I think he's a auto mechanic. He may have like two lines. Okay. The great and late Tom Petty has a short appearance in here. Nice. Has a, a ne'er-do-well um, that Hutton bumps into and has to interact with. Okay. And then the, um, our favorite rock god, Neil Young, is in this movie. Oh, wow. Okay. And ironically, or maybe not ironically, uh, Neil Young actually writes the big show-stopping tune, We Never Danced, which was performed in the movie by Martha Davis of the Motels. Okay. But if you're a big Neil Young fan, you'll also know that it appears on one of his albums about that same time. I hope it's not too late. We were more than friends. And I can hardly wait till we meet again. We never dance.
think of Martha Davis as one of the kind of underrated voices of the 80s. I just yeah. love her singing voice. I think this song appears on a greatest hits compilation for the motels. In the course of the movie, the song was written by Mike. Okay. And it's, and it's, and he, where he's starting to become cognizant of there's somebody I'm in love with. I something just, something missing. I just can't put the something beat. missing. I can't, right, right. It's like it's on, there's something that's on the tip of his tongue and he can't, you can't quite figure it out. Right. And pieces start to come together. He sees a, a trumpet in a pawn shop and that kind of reminds him of a moment he had in heaven. And oh my slowly, God, seriously, I'm rolling my eyes so hard at that. Hey, you got you got to give this movie a chance. You got you got you have to have a H E A R T, bro. Oh man. Okay. Okay. I cry like a baby during this movie. Cry like a baby Every- during Wildcats. Come on. <laughs> when she throws her stopwatch, you hold me and she goes, <laughs> "You bunch of pussies." <laughs> Yes, but <laughs> actually, mainly you cry at the bad officiating. But anyway, yeah. Oh my god, that just drives me bat crazy. You know that. But it's an interesting movie. It's it's at a time in my life. You know, I think when we, we were probably sophomores. I don't know if I saw this in the theaters. It had the world's worst trailer. Yeah, 1987. It made it look like, that would have been. Yeah, it made it look like Xanadu. So I think I saw it years <laughs> later on HBO. Okay. It wasn't. It was no gangbusters. In fact. Critics really did not like it. It has a 40% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Hmm. Everyone's favorite movie critic, the late, great Roger Ebert, says it would have been more entertaining had the story stayed in heaven and explored the rules and themes of the afterlife instead of going back to Earth. I couldn't disagree more. I, well, I, don't, I don't like that, that kind of Monday morning quarterbacking. Don't don't tell us what you think it should have been, Mr. Ebert. Like, talk about he's, how, he's what it gets Ebert. right in the... I know, but I that's, know. Like, that's like saying, I don't like job. green eggs in a ham. They should have talked more about the sausage. Like who cares? What that's just like okay. totally random. You should have stayed in heaven. It now was that's more- gonna be stuck in my head. <laughs> mm, sausage. See, I'm trying to get sausage. something you can relate to. It just that that kind of criticism isn't criticism. It's not. I, it's okay. not helpful. Okay. Anyway. It's an opinion, so it can't be wrong. Your your opinion, I mean. My opinion is that that's not helpful. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Forty percent approval rate. Critics basically didn't like it. I still love this movie. I saw it probably in the early '90s at a time in my life when. I was still trying to figure things out, who I was going to be. Yeah. I wasn't having any luck romantically. I think there was like a four-year period of time when I was living in Jacksonville, which is pretty sure where I saw this movie uh, on HBO. But I I don't think I had a date for four years. So I feel your pain. It's there. I like the fact that they go through the pain Yeah, and that they have – there's the scenes where the two of them are breaking down on earth. It's all becoming too much for them. Okay. That they know that there's something missing and they can't wrap their minds around it. That would make you crazy. I love it though. I mean, to me, I can, I can relate to that. Yeah. And when they finally see each other again, um, towards the end of the movie, at the very, very end, you know, spoiler alert. Wait, they get back together. Damn it. (laughs) On his 30th birthday. Oh, of course. Of course. Right at the last minute. And the curse is broken. Oh, nice. And everything makes sense again. The pain is lifted. Haven't you ever had a moment like that where you're just in so much pain and turmoil and then suddenly like someone turns on the light bulb and it just kind of disappears? Yeah. You know, I'm kind of been ragging on this movie just because it seems silly. But when you talk about that time in our lives and, you know, not so much in 87, but before I met Katie, I don't. You know, basically, it was the college girlfriend, and then a very long dry spell until I met Katie. Um, so, yeah, I was basically alone, and like, well, I guess this is what it's like now. And I don't know if I've told this story on the podcast, but I remember the day I met Katie. I remember the minute I met Katie. I remember what she was wearing. I remember where we were standing in the office. It was my first day at work at my new job, and you know that moment obviously transformed my life. So maybe I do relate to this movie more than I thought. Yeah. Tell you, give it a chance. Okay. And I think you're gonna end up liking it. I was hoping I'd see you again. Here I am. What would you like to do? I'd like to marry you. According to heaven, we already are. Between heaven and earth. There's a ballroom floor.
So it's your turn, Brad. What movie from the fall of 1987 are you going to defend? I'm going to defend a picture that I like to call No Man's Land. I hear you're pretty good with German cars. Horses? I'm okay. (laughs) You hear about Joel? He's the detective that was killed last week. Yeah. I want the guys who got him. No, did it? Yeah, I can't prove it. I think it's a local outfit stealing Porsches. They're operating out of a repair shop. My money's on the owner, a guy named Ted Varick. Which stars Vin Diesel and Paul Walker. It was released on June 22nd, 2001, and uh, it eventually pulled in $145 million in domestic box office. Wait, wait, no. That's the remake of No Man's Land. Perhaps you've heard of it. It is called The Fast and the Furious. Uh Oh, so I talked about this. <laughs> I talked about this movie last fall. Uh, go back and listen to episode 380 when we were just starting to do our "What's Your 80s Obsessions." And when I saw this on the list, I'm like, "Oh, I have to talk some more about this movie." <laughs> nice to see you. Good to see you. I just wanted to thank you again for helping me out the other night. I appreciate that. Oh, no problem. How's that car running? It's running great. The yeah. Basic plot line follows that of the Fast and the Furious. But it is uh, the setting and the way that it is presented is just so gloriously, deliciously 80s. I don't know that there's any substance to the movie, but the style is unmistakable. It's just, it's a lot of fun. But you've got Wall Street era Charlie Sheen, who instead of playing a scrappy stockbroker trying to make it, is a rich playboy who already made it and, uh, you know, scratches that itch by stealing Porsches, uh, which he loves to do almost as much as he loves driving them. You've got a, a young D.B. Sweeney, who I always want to call D.B. Cooper. Um, <laughs> he's not a bank robber, I don't think. As an undercover cop who poses as a mechanic to try to get the goods on Sheen. And Laura Harris as Sheen's sister, who D.B. Sweeney falls for hard. Uh, as She's kind of like the, you know, like, you could have all of this, this lifestyle, this woman, if you just turn to the dark side. Hey, Bill. Yeah. What are you doing tonight? I don't know. Nothing special. Great. Look, I'm heading out with some friends to a club that I go to, and I thought you might like to come along. I'd love to. Great. Address is on there, and I'll see you, say, like 1, 1.30. A.M.? A.M., yeah. Just give that to the guy at the door. You're not kidding, man. This is a total ripoff. It, I mean, I mean, it really is. It really I mean, it is, is. It is like plot point for plot point. Yeah. And like I said, it's almost secondary. When Seeing it now through Fast and the Furious eyes, you're like, hey, I've seen this, but you haven't seen it this way. And that's what I think is interesting about it. You've got the cars. I mean, it is the movie is just lousy with Porsche 911s. What about this one? Not too shabby, huh? Nah, Italian trash. Besides, I only steal Porsches. The parties. There's a joke at one point about the men are going to powder their noses more than the women are. There's so much cocaine getting done at these parties. Take a look around, Bill. Welcome to the lifestyle of the rich and aimless. And it's just glitz and money and kind of the the prettier side of less than zero. It makes sense. Yeah. Actually, I hadn't thought about that. I'd more thought about it being the opposite side of the cop movie coin than the party culture coin. But maybe it's kind of both. Uh, I kind of see this as the opposite side of the coin to uh, To Live and Die in L.A., which I love that movie. And To Live and Die in L.A., you know, the good cop becomes the bad cop. Right. At the end of the movie, he has assumed that, you know, you work for me now. And I love I, that's just I, that transformation is, is fantastic. But in this movie, the good cop basically stays the good cop. You know, he, he puts his foot in the pool, but then he comes back and he's trying to arrest Charlie Sheen, not kill Charlie Sheen. Nice. So it is a well-worn plot, but it is a lot of fun. Uh, it's hard to find. I had to buy the DVD. I think it's out on Blu-ray. But if you're in the neighborhood, stop by. I will have a private screening for you. Of course, I've got it on my media server. Who doesn't sound creepy at all? <laughs> well, who watches physical media anymore, Steve? Anyway, so the, the we talked about the main cast, uh, but the only other really notable actor in it other than Los Angeles and the Untouchables who play one of the party scenes is Randy Quaid, who... Uh, he, he plays the uh, the police lieutenant that you're trying to figure out the whole time if he's corrupt or not. You're really hating this, huh? You told me to get close to him. Look, just don't go native on me, all right? What's that supposed to mean? You know exactly what it means. The movie's directed by Peter Werner, who has done almost no feature work, but has been doing television for almost as long as there's been television. 
And uh, the script was written by Peter Wolf, who was, uh, you know, kind of had some free time since he wasn't out in front of Jake Giles' band. <laughs> Oh, wait, no, wrong guy. It was written by Dick Wolf, who uh, also a big TV guy. He was the writer and co-producer for seasons three and four of Miami Vice, which may have provided some inspiration for the script. That's not who Ted is. Oh, Ted. What are we, best buddies now? How involved are you, Benji? I don't know, involved. Look, I'm sick of lying. I, I, I can't do this anymore. I feel dirty. I don't even know when I'm lying anymore. Ron Howard was executive producer, and the score, which I actually really like, it's very synth-heavy, uh, was written by Basil Polidorus, who scored such classics as both Conan movies, Barbarian and Destroyer, Robocop, Red Dawn, Iron Eagle, and Steve, are you ready for this? Yes. Summer Lovers. Oh, Summer Lovers. Why can't we just do a whole show on Summer Lovers? We could. I think we did. You might have. It's, we've mentioned it enough times. We should get residuals every time, for, especially for that one. <laughs> Starting to get that way with Made in Heaven, too. I, I'm yeah. sorry. I swear I'll never mention it again. Uh, this is as much as we're going to talk about No Man's Land. So for some reason, this didn't really get much of a release. I don't know if there was a problem with the studio or what, but it was only f in about 500 theaters for a couple of three weeks. It did not make much money. Uh, the gross was under $3 million. So that was enough to buy, you know, like 70 or 80 Porsche 911s at the time. So what did the critics say, though? The critics hated it, right? Uh, for the most part, yes. But Roger Ebert, who uh, I will invoke as it pleases me, he liked it. He gave it three three out of four stars. What are they? Ebert thumbs? Thumbs. Yeah, thumbs up. Yeah. He said it. He says, and I quote, the movie has lots of scenes of Sheen and Sweeney stealing cars, and it dwells on the details of their crimes and the reckless way they risk capture. This is a movie about how money and excitement generate a seduction that can change personal values. It's better and deeper than you might expect. Don't you trust me? Should I? Yeah, I don't know. You're the unknown here, Benji, not me. I am. Who the f*** are you, Ted? You killed Bracey, didn't you? Look, I did what I had to. Okay. If we're all so corrupt, why didn't you just buy him? I saved your life, man. Did you? It was Lucy set up for me. Look, you're alive, right? I f***ing trusted you. Yeah. We were friends. Yeah, we were. You know, I keep thinking that maybe we get past all this. Yeah, we can't, can we? Nope. I gotta bust you, Ted. Ebert's he's so weird. I mean, he can he can defend like a schlocky R movie like this and then at the same time you take a shot at my beloved Timothy Hutton and Kelly McGillick's classic. There's just no but explaining it. He's he he was hot and cold. Maybe so, the deep dish pizza wasn't good that day. Yeah, maybe not. So No Man's Land is available. You say it's hard to find these days. You can, yeah, really can't. I think this is a physical media. I couldn't find. There are clips on YouTube of some of the, the better car chases, which are kind of fun to watch. Right. But the full movie is not available right now. And Made in Heaven, I should say, uh, available on Amazon Prime. And you can also, of course, uh, still buy the DVD. You know what you can't buy, though? Love. The, the Seggies. Ah, uh, the mystical connection that is uh, listener mailbag. This week we have email from Donnie Ghetto, rhymes with metal. Uh, what does Donnie have to say? Donnie, I, Donnie saves me here. Uh, you may remember in the last episode we talked a little bit about what kind of shenanigans we got up to in our hometowns when we were little kids. Donnie writes yeah. about that. Well, let's just jump in here, shall we? Yeah. Donnie writes, holy shit, <laughs> you hit me again <laughs> with your biscuit story. <laughs> <laughs> we did that too in Miami, Oklahoma. There was a transitional area in the middle of town that was basically a wasteland of a super fun creek with woods all around it. We're talking several square miles of who knows who owns this land, but it was our playground in those days. You know that you and I are the same age, so I completely connected on that story. We would hide out in the bushes on the edge of the woods and next to one of those streets people used to get from one side of the town to the other. We would throw canned biscuits at the cars. The big thrill was the screech of the tires and the threats of the driver screaming into the ditch at us while he ran back into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the only one, my oaky brother. Still stuck in the 80s, Donnie Gettle rhymes with canned biscuits. Still can't get over that. I've been craving canned biscuits ever since that last uh, podcast, too. I feel so vindicated my... by this because I was beginning to think I made the whole thing up. 
No, uh, that's crazy. So Donnie and I have exchanged emails. As it turns out, he and I have a lot of parallels. Both grew up in Oklahoma. Both of us played bassoon, if you can believe that. Or as he says, we're the same age. The only difference is he was over on the eastern side of the state, which, as I call it, the pretty side of the state, where there are actually some trees. Where's Norman? Is Norman Norman is of the basically state? put a pin in the middle of Oklahoma, and that's where Oklahoma City is. And Norman is about a half hour south of there. It's like a, like a suburb almost. Well, yeah, it's a not, university. It's not a quiet. Yeah, it's a college town, and it's—I mean, there's enough air gap there that it's not Oklahoma City, but it's pretty close. Yeah, I mean, I've been to both places. That's, that's the last time I was in Oklahoma City, and, and Norman was for a, a cousin's wedding, and that was nice. Uh, probably about the same time I saw Made in Heaven, which is probably what's screwing me up. <laughs> we finally, you know, the circle is now complete. Somebody bring me some canned biscuits. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to send you some from Amazon Pantry. Anyway. Have we got another email this week? We do. We have one from our longtime friend of the show, Carol Jansen, with two N's. Nice. Yeah. So Isn't Carol, Carol Jansen with two S's. Oh, it's also two S's, yeah. Well, two S's and two N's is just too long of a last name. We'll just call yeah. her Carol Jansen. You know, she's got her own theme music, so it can be whatever she wants it to be. So Carol writes, Hi, guys. I know you two like to talk about your latest obsessions, but why not open it up to your listeners? I am in love with this new arrangement that the Nordic band AHA has released. So needless to say, I'm on and ends, but that's me, I'm stumbling away. Slowly learning that life is okay and say after me, it's no better to be safe than sorry and I take on. Take On Me takes on a whole new tone and meaning to me now, and I can finally understand the lyrics. They've just released their MTV Unplugged album, recorded in Giske Island, Norway. And while I was not a huge fan in the 80s, I only really knew two of their songs, I'm really loving this now. Also, their lead singer, Morton Harkett, has a beautiful solo song that I just found, only about five years late. I have played these two songs so many times. It's, dare I say, an obsession. Always loving the 80s, Carol. We are going to do a show soon about our favorite acoustic versions of 80s songs. We're going to do it after I get back from 80s in the Sand, which is about one week away from the time you're listening to the show. If you're listening to the show on the day we released it, which seemingly why, most people do. Why wouldn't you? We'll see. I'm looking forward to that one. That's going to be fun uh so look yeah. for that. It's going to be probably in either late November or early December. We'll do yeah. our show on that. And I'm sure it'll be a, a more than one parter. The days are we'll, short. We're going to be feeling a little mopey. You know, we'll take down right. these take take down these songs a notch or two and listen to the acoustic version. I got to tell you, this MTV Unplugged album, I heard um, the acoustic version of The Sun Always Shines on TV, and I was just almost weeping. It is just beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were both listening at the same time at work today, and you said, you you text me like goosebumps. I'm like, oh, goosebumps here too. And I'm just like, what is going on with me here? We've we've become a couple of old ladies. I don't know, but uh, yeah, well, I really well, enjoyed it. At least we have people. I don't to know. Talk that to that sounds it. insulting. That sounds insulting. It's we're okay. all. Uh, as always, we love your emails. Uh, send them to podcast at sit80s.com. dot com. What's happening, hot stuff? Ah, by the sound of the gong, it must be time for Mystery Movie Moment. We'll play a snippet of a movie from the 80s, and if you can get it right, you're entered into the drawing for a bottle opener. We still have bottle openers? We got bottle openers. Oh, okay. yeah. Soon we'll have the rubber bands again, right? Because there will be – we'll have to Don't order some of those for the a Rubber bands, silicon bracelets. Silicon Is that bracelets. what we're supposed to call them? They're not rubber bands. Bracelets. Use rubber bands to wrap newspapers so you can deliver them. Not anymore, you don't. Occasionally, they come around broccoli, but you don't know what broccoli is either, so it's okay. Hey, I love broccoli. Broccoli spears? How can I not like it? Oh, my gosh. I haven't thought about that. 
So there you go. Uh, pay attention. Here's the clip from the last time we did this seggy. Do you have anything besides Mexican food? Yes, that's three amigos. We didn't fool too many people. Yeah, we keep going back to the well on that one. I can't help it. It is classic. I'm sorry. So Read some of the winners. We did a show like a year ago, like which bad movie is better, Three Amigos versus Golden Child? I don't even remember what we decided. I think we decided Three Amigos was better. Good, because I don't want to have to go back to the you know, back to the future past and beat you up for being wrong. No, um, no, okay. it's, more, it's more quotable, so yeah. It certainly is. Okay, winners this week include Ninja Mark in Arizona, Rick Korolek, Dave Parrott, Canuck and Kelly, Tom Corn in Austria, Mike Wally Walters, Cecil Calhoun, and Jeff Rox in Indiana, who writes, I almost put my car in a ditch last week when neither of you Euro Trash keyboard worshippers could name who performed Fight the Power. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> Harsh but fair. That's all I can say. Harsh but fair. Oh, man. I just... Uh, that that trivia thing that Jen does is hard. Yeah. I mean, it's if you if you saw it written on a piece of paper, you'd have a better chance. Yeah. It just comes and, out and of nowhere. You know, when I come back to the, the podcast Council of Elders and, and say, I don't think that these, uh, these challenges should be so long and so hard. I feel a little bit like Corbin Burson's character in uh, uh, Major League when he brings out his contract. He says, says, I don't have to do any calisthenics. <laughs> like, yeah, it just seems like to. I'm whining. But they're hard. <laughs> the first week seemed easier. This last week seemed too hard. So I'm just saying. Pay attention. Here's this week's uh, magical mystery clip. Oh, you're having a good time. I'm happy for you. I can't say as I feel the same way. It's kind of bizarre yourself, you know? It's spooky. If you know it, email us at podcast at sit80s.com. Ah, yes, the familiar tune that is, name that 80s tune. Uh, we will play a snippet of a song from the 80s if you can get it right. Again, you're entered into a drawing that we're about to have for that Eternal beloved glory. Chain. Yes. Uh, pay attention. Here's the clip from the last time we did this seggy. That's Every Day is Halloween by Ministry. There's no truth to the rumor that I used the exact same drop for that that we did in the last Halloween music show. Because I would never do that. That would be lazy. <laughs> you did. No, I did. I picked the song. You picked the song, but I edited the I edited the last show so I can use that same music clip here. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, Efficiency. We, this song's been playing in my head pretty much nonstop for the last three days. The um, I don't know. You listen to First Wave on uh, Sirius XM Radio, right? I do, I do, when I'm not, you know, ankle deep in podcasts. Our buddy Lori Majewski, who's on, who is the, who has the talk show on about music called Volume, I believe. Mm -hmm. She's been on First Wave a lot lately. Oh, and for Halloween she did her Boo Wave list. Oh yeah, I caught a little bit of that. It was really good. And she leads it off with Every Day Is Halloween. So it's it's always fun to hear her voice on First Wave. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's list some let's list some listeners. Let's 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 list some nis listeners. Let's list some winners. Super winners this week include Kelly E, Cal in Atlanta, Beat Poet J, Doctor Dim, Alan Titus, Lou Sweet Lou Grilly, Jeremy in St. Pete, Jeff in Texas, and Heather August, the long suffering wife of Dave Augie August. Okay, my friends, spin the wheel. See who's the lucky. Soul. And it's slowing down, and it's going to land on Ninja Mark in Arizona. Hey, you're this week's uh, winner. Send us your snail mail address via email. We will get on it. It's a thing. In the meantime, pay attention. Here's this week's mystery clip. If you know it, email us at podcast at sit80s.com. And tune in next week to find out if you're the winner. We'll be right back after this commercial break. 
has two wheels and two sources of power, goes from zero to 192 in one shift, and can take you places just standing still. DX100 synthesizer. Anything's possible. And we're back. We have a few minutes left. We want to give you a heads up on a couple upcoming shows. First of all, you know we're going to do the acoustic show. That'll be fun. Yep. That's, I'm looking forward Can't to that. Wait. I'm really looking forward to preparing for that one because I just want to spend hours listening to some of these songs and trying to like narrow them down to the five or ten that we pick for the podcast. Yeah. I don't know if I'll be able to post podcasts from 80s in the sand. It's the week of November 11th through 18th. I'll be down in Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic hosting trivia. And I'll be there with our MTV VJ friends, Alan, Mark, and Nina. Uh, downtown Julie Brown, I think, is there as well. Yeah. Uh, Richard Blade from uh, First Wave. And then just every band you can possibly imagine. Every band and like two-thirds of the actors and actresses. Right. So I don't know if we'll be able to post any podcasts while we're down there, but if not, we'll at least when, when I get back, we'll we'll talk about what happened. We'll have a big old uh, wrap up. We'll post game should, the hell out of that thing. Right. We should know what the lineup is for 2018. Uh, and then we have this really cool, unusual show that I'm looking forward to hearing um, that Brad's going to put together for the week that I'm gone. Tell tell him about this, Brad. Okay. So about, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, occasional guest host Gail emailed us with a suggestion, basically pitched us on a show. She said, Hey, you know, I've been listening to this show for a long time and I feel like there's things I would like to know more about you guys. How about if I interview you? And so, I don't know, this has been maybe a month or so ago now. We sat down and I had several cocktails and Steve had several cocktails and the tongues were wagging and <laughs> we talked for a long time. I've been trying to give it some space before I go back to edit it because it's just there's a lot of material in there and I want to be judicious in what uh, I edit because I think it's a pretty fun conversation. But yeah, so you know, she asked some questions we've never been asked and so it, it was a fun conversation. So we'll have that probably for November 18th, I'm thinking. That's almost yeah. a done deal. That's going to be the show for that week. So lots of fun coming your way. It's going to be a good month. We got some stuff going on. Steve's out of town. So, you know, we'll, we'll have our hand on the tiller here and try not to, to upset the stuck in the 80s watercraft too much. I'll, I'll try to get a webcam installed so people can watch Cat Benatar in real time. Oh, that's a great idea. She sleeps away for a whole week while I'm gone. She's sleeping right in front of me right now. We'll be expanding our social media uh, reach. We're going to open up our own uh, Snapchat account. Wait, no. Oh, no, please, God. No, we're not. No, we're not. You, that's like the third time this week somebody's said that to me. Like, oh, you Snapchat. I'm like, no. Yeah, I, I've told you I'm on Snapchat now, but I I refuse any friend requests. I don't post anything on my story. The only thing I use it for is to chat with my kids. Okay. Because that's what they said. Hey, this is how I want to communicate. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll do that if that's what you want. Sometimes it's good to be single and lonely. <laughs> Nobody knows that more than uh, Kelly McGillis and <laughs> Timothy Hutton. Uh, for 30 years, they had to wander Anyway, in the that's dark. all we have time for this week. Don't forget to watch these movies if you feel like it. Email us in. Let us know what you think. Follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter. Don't forget that we're also on iTunes, Google Play, and CLS Media Mobile app. And until next time, Brad and I remain here, hopelessly stuck in the 80s. Stuck in the 80s is a member of the CLNS Media Network. Special thanks to Check Battery Daily for our theme music. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or the CLNS Media mobile app.